This morning we are here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to worship the living God. As we worship together, let's still our hearts and minds as we meditate on our call to worship, the words of our Saviour from John 10, verse 10, where he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's join together to sing. Creation sings. We'll remain seated to sing. Having sung his praise, let's now come before him in prayer. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, yet you invite us to call you Father. Heavenly Father, we humbly approach you to declare your praise. You are the God who gives life to all things, the one who has meticulously designed the universe, and we are the pinnacle of your creation, made to enjoy all that you have made and to delight in you. It was your hand that created all the splendor that so often leaves us lost for words. 
Father, you are sovereign. Nothing in this universe can surprise you because you are in and through all things. You have taken us, made from the dust of the ground, now adopted into your family, children through the work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You are faithful, merciful, and unchanging. And despite your love for us, your protecting of us, we are fickle people. Even when we try our best to please you, we trample underfoot the gospel of your Son. We love our sin more than our Heavenly Father. We are tempted to try harder rather than rest in the goodness of Jesus. We fail to love you with all that we are. And so this infects every, infects every aspect of our lives. We suffer, those around us suffer, and we lose all touch with you. It is our prayer this morning that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us by your Spirit, enabling us to put sin to death, and give us eyes to see the joy found only in you. Lord, in this painful and difficult season, we still have so much to be thankful for. We thank you for the joy of joining together to worship you. Help us to never take this blessing for granted again. And may you cause us to look upward in love to you and left and right in love and fellowship towards those gathered here as one family. Father, we thank you for our medical professionals, scientists and politicians who made in your image have the capacity to navigate these unprecedented times. Even this is an evidence of your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the reopening of schools where our children can develop and make friends. We thank you for the reopening of many businesses in the coming weeks. Oh, how we long to visit our favorite stores. Father, we take a moment to think of others. We pray that you would strengthen James this morning by the power of your spirit as he delivers your word. Lord, we pray for our staff team and thank you for them. As a church, we pray for our young people and children. We thank you for the faithful dedication of Stephen and Rebecca and for the love and care they provide for all our young people during this difficult time. We pray for our adventurers, that they will enjoy all the activities during the service, but most of all, find you. Lord, we pray for a calming of tensions in our land. Bring wisdom to the table for a peaceful resolution. Father, we take a moment to consider those stricken with grief, burdened with illness, both physical and mental. We lift up the lonely, the isolated and the weary, and we pray that your tender mercy would come to their aid. And we pray for ourselves, that your spirit would strengthen us as we worship, bringing glory and honour to your name. It is in and through Jesus we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to take a little break from our series in Acts. So if you have your Bible with me, with you, turn to Romans 8. And this morning we're going to focus on verses 18 through to 30. But now we're going to start at verse 1 and 2. And then we're going to jump down to verse 14, reading the whole way through to verse 30. Don't worry, it'll all become clear. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now come with me to verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope 
that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is God's word. Amen. Before we turn to hear from God's word, we're going to sing again, King of Kings, after which our adventurers will leave. Father, we need your help. Your word contains truths too complex for our minds. Send your spirit to bring wisdom 
and clarity. It is our prayer this morning that your word would provide strength for the weary. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Please do turn with me to Romans 8. And as we begin our time together, I want to ask a question. How has your year been? For some, it started off with optimism. In fact, I remember one preacher as he stood in this pulpit. We'll give him a random name, despairs, blushes, James will do. And as James stood in this very pulpit to deliver a sermon on hope, he mocked us Chelsea fans, poking fun at our so-called false hope. Last time I checked, Chelsea were still in the Champions League, the final of the FA Cup with Thursday nights off. It all started off so well, only to crash and burn for United. He's not here today, he knew that was coming. All joking aside, and on a more serious note, how has your year been? For some of us, it has been a year of loss, an empty seat at the dinner table. For some of us, it has been a year of unwelcome diagnosis, perhaps the return of an illness once conquered. For all of us, the closest we have been to our loved ones is talking to them through a window. No warm embrace, no hand to hold. For some of us, we have went to bed one evening and got up the next morning with the intention of going to work, but no job to go to. All of us have lost opportunities. University, well, what's that? We have missed being able to go to school, meet with friends and play the sports we enjoy. There have been times this year when someone has kindly asked, how are you? And we've said, I'm fine, but inside we're holding back tears of pain. And at times this has led us to asking, where is God in all of this? Or perhaps cried, why does God let his dearly loved children suffer? Well, thank goodness for Romans 8. When all seems dead and buried, Romans 8 points to the light at the end of the tunnel. In the first 16 verses of Romans 8, Paul tells us what it means to be in the family of God. It all seems so good, and then Paul is a realist. He doesn't shy away from the truth. Verse 17, he explains how we too must share in Christ's sufferings in order to share in his glory. This morning, we're going to take a whistle-stop tour of verses 18 to 30, merely scratching the surface. I have given it the title, our hope from eternity past for eternity future. And during our time together, I want to draw attention to three things. The first is our current situation. Secondly, our helper. And finally, God's purpose. Let's consider the first together. Paul unpacks our current situation. If this were a movie at this point, there would be a warning scenes some viewers may find upsetting. The first thing that Paul pinpoints is that suffering is real. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that this morning. Paul tells us this in verse 18. The word suffering here is not simply persecution for being a Christian, but the word suffering here refers to all the pain and toil we experience in this life. Paul doesn't shy away from it. As long as we live in these bodies, we will suffer. I have many non-Christian friends, and I'm sure you're the same, and if you're to ask them why we suffer, they don't really have an answer. But as Christians, we do. Verse 20, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Here Paul gives us the answer. Creation has been subject to frustration by the will of the one who, in other words, made that so. On my first time reading this verse, I wanted to put the Bible down. Who is the one who subjected it? Some people have argued Adam through his sin, which, yes, there is an element of truth. The other option is that the devil subjected it due to his deceit, but... It's not him either. This leaves us with only one other option. 
something that I myself didn't want to admit because it doesn't fit in with who, with what my view of who God is. But the language is clear. God is the one who subjected it. And here Paul is taking his readers on a journey back to the garden in Genesis 3, where Satan tempted, where Adam and Eve delighted in their sin. And at this point, God has every right to destroy his creation and start all over again. As I worked on this sermon, I watched James's sermon from just before Christmas on Genesis 3. And how what God actually does in Genesis 3 is gracious. God is holy, good, foreign to sin, just. And so when sin entered the world, we could have no complaint if he were to totally annihilate his creation. But he doesn't, does he? Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today, would we? No. Genesis 3 and verse 17, God curses the ground. In other words, he places a curse on creation And we as members of the created order, we fall under that curse. Why suffering? Why pain? Why illness? Let's be very clear about this. It is not because God is sticking the knife in you and actively punishing you each day. No. It is a result of that curse in the garden where Adam fell and as a result the whole created order with him. Back to Romans 8 and verse 20. Paul ends with two words, in hope. As he builds on this in verse 21, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. This is why Paul can say in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul is not minimizing suffering, and neither am I. Suffering is real. It is brutal. But here Paul tells us that not all is in vain. There is something coming that will far outweigh them all. There is present suffering, but Paul is anticipating future glory. Not only is Paul eagerly waiting in expectation, but so too is creation, The subhuman creation. Let me explain it like this. Imagine you're on the mile outside Buckingham Palace. There's a royal parade on your five or six rows back from the barrier. You begin to hear the claps of the crowd, the galloping sounds of the horses, and so you stretch your neck in order to catch a glimpse of royalty. That's what Paul is speaking of in verse 19. It's as if he has personified creation so that it stretches its neck to catch a glimpse of future glory. Indeed, in the very same breath that God announced that curse in the garden, he announced the hope we have in Jesus. And so creation stretches its neck, so to speak, to that day of his return. Paul continues in the verse 21. The hope creation longs for is to be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Just as creation fell by one man, so too it will not rise again until all the children of God are assembled. And Paul continues his personification in the verse 22. You'll know by looking at me that I have never given birth, nor do I ever plan to. I don't know what it feels like, but I know I never want to know. But here Paul uses the image of giving birth to epitomize the hope. There must first be a period of excruciating pain that produces future glory. This is our current situation, present suffering and future hope. The second thing I want us to capture is we have a helper. Who is this helper? Well, verses 23 to 27 tell us. The helper is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Paul has already in Romans 8 laid out on the table what it means to be a Christian. We are already in the family of God, but we have not yet received all that there is. There is more to come. We live in the already, 
but not yet. We are already adopted into the family of God, but we have not yet reaped all that God has for us. So, I think it is helpful to think of the Holy Spirit as an engagement ring. He is a down payment, a pledge, or, or a first fruit of what is yet to come. That's really what an engagement ring is. I have already decided to make her my wife, but not yet. The promise will be fulfilled. And because the time has not yet come for the renewal of all things, Jesus gives his church an engagement ring. The Holy Spirit to be a helper in the life of each believer. And I believe Paul lays out two ways in which the Holy Spirit helps us. The first is this. The Holy Spirit brings believers into harmony with the orchestra of creation. I'm not going to overly dwell on this, but that is to say that believers join with creation in the longing for the renewal of all things. Paul has told us how the creation groans. And now in verse 23, we are told that having the first fruits of the Spirit, we too groan. Paul does not mean that we moan. There are enough moaners in this world. Nor does Paul mean that we audibly groan. But he is building on his earlier illustration. What Paul is saying is that just like creation, the Spirit causes us to look beyond the frailty, the evil, the unjust, and the trials of this world to focus on the future hope. In a world obsessed with scientific data, a world that puts its hope in things that are seen. Paul tells us that this isn't hope at all. In a world where our vision is blurred by the suffering that invades our lives and we no longer see the hope we are called to, the Spirit provides the lens that enables us to focus on our future hope. The second thing that the Spirit does for us is that he intercedes for us. Some people come to this part of the passage and use these verses to support a secret or special prayer language. I believe that that only tramples what is actually happening here. It is something far more profound than we could ever begin to imagine. Verse 26. I wonder, has there been a time in the past year or throughout your life when you have knelt to pray and despite having prayed your whole life, you find yourself bent over before God with no words to say at all. Life just seems unbearable. Words are not enough to begin to describe how you feel. You don't even know if you're praying the right thing. Verse 26 explains that in these moments, moments of pain and anguish, when all hope seems lost, that the Spirit helps us. Notice Paul doesn't say that the Spirit takes over. No, he joins with us. He bears our burdens alongside us. We must not think that the Holy Spirit prays for us and so then we don't have to. No. When we make the effort to pray and all our efforts are in vain, the Spirit intercedes for us. In other words, he prays for us through wordless groans. Again, I don't believe audible groans, but Paul is once again building on that imagery he has created for the longing of all things new. The Holy Spirit joins with us and groans for renewal. And we can have overwhelming confidence in this work of the Spirit. Verse 27. Because God who looks into our hearts where the indwelling ministry of intercession is performed by the Spirit and he acknowledges the prayers of the Holy Spirit on our behalf. Not only that, but God knows exactly what the Spirit intends because the Spirit prays in accordance with the will of God. This is the unbreakable relationship shared by the Trinity, that they know each other intimately and so they can cooperate together in bringing about God's purpose. The Spirit takes our broken prayers and empty words transforming them into a perfect prayer that is carried to our Heavenly Father. One commentator writes, There is one in heaven 
the Son of God, who intercedes on our behalf, defending us from all charges that might be brought against us, guaranteeing salvation in the day of judgment. That's what James taught us last week from Acts 1. But here's the key to these verses. Listen. But there is also, Paul asserts in these verses, an intercessor in the heart, the Spirit of God, who effectively prays to the Father on our behalf throughout the difficulties and uncertainties of our lives here on earth. We have a helper. The next time you kneel to pray and life takes the words from your mouth, even if you kneel to pray and life is good, remember God has blessed you with a helper to make your imperfect prayers conform to his will. We have looked at two of the three headings I wanted us to consider together. Paul has shown us our current situation. He has drawn us to our helper. And the final thing to note is this. God's purpose. Look with me at verses 28 to 30. One theologian has coined these verses the nuclear bunker for the Christian. No matter what goes on outside, these verses are impenetrable. Paul says in verse 28, I'm sure you've heard it before, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Notice these verses are not for everyone. There are qualifiers. This verse is for those who love God, the the called ones, in other words, Christians. For the believer, this promise is a nuclear bunker Even when things appear that they could not go any worse, God is working them for good. Situations in and of themselves may not be good, but God is working through them. Even our sin. The Bible makes clear that we should avoid sinning at all costs, but even our sin falls under this promise. Even the sin of the believer, God works for good. I think the story of Joseph is helpful here. Betrayed, beaten, and thrown into a cistern by his brothers, then sold to merchants. As the story unfolds, Joseph ends up in Egypt. Then he's accused of sexual misconduct by a wife of one of Pharaoh's officials. He ends up in jail. There is then a famine in his homeland that affects his own own family. None of this is good. But God was sovereignly at work, elevating Joseph to be in charge of Egypt. So that when his brothers come looking for food, Joseph is their hero. And the family is reunited. What is it that Joseph says at the end? You intended to harm me, speaking to his brothers. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And even here, we see many parallels to the cross. Now, Paul could easily stop this section here. He has told the readers that all things are working for good. He has told them that God has a purpose. He could end this here. But he doesn't. Look at what he says in verse 29. Chin up, lads, tomorrow's a new day. That is not what Paul says. Rather, Paul wants us to have a better understanding of of how God is working all things for the good of his people. It's almost as if Paul pulls back the curtain on the drama that is this world and we get a glimpse into the seat of the director, how he is pulling strings and orchestrating all things. And here in verse 29, Paul uses certain words to help solidify our confidence. Think about the context here. Paul is assuring those reading of God's sovereign plan. And so that is the mindset we must adopt too. How do these verses reassure me that God is working for my good? The first word Paul uses is the word for new. The Greek for this word comes from the word gnosis, which is the Greek word for knowledge. 
I'm sure we've heard this word used before. When we are sick and we go to the doctor, we hope that he can give us, or he or she can give us a diagnosis, a knowledge of what is wrong. But here Paul is not talking about a knowledge of facts and figures. Cast your eye to verse 29. God foreknew those. Paul is speaking of of God knowing people in an intimate way. It's an intimate relationship. Paul was a Jew, raised with a detailed knowledge of the Old Testament. And as he wrote this, I have no doubt in my mind that he was thinking about Jeremiah chapter 1. Where God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. The word new here is actually chose. The same that was true of Jeremiah is true of us as Christians. Before we were even conceived, before we were even a twinkle in our mother's eye, in fact, before the foundations of the world, God knew us in an intimate way. He set us apart. He fixed his love upon you. Paul continues this idea of being known intimately by God. We were known by him so that he might predestine or choose us. Again, the story of Joseph is helpful here. Why was Joseph chosen? He was one of 12 sons. He wasn't even the firstborn son. He wasn't going to be the one to inherit what his father leaves behind. He wasn't even strong. He was rather weak as his brothers beat him. Joseph was not chosen because he had a lot to offer, nor because he had super strength. But he was chosen to be an example to his brothers on behalf of God or the nation Israel. I don't even know if we could call the nation before God chose them. They were slaves in Egypt, a group of nobodies with nothing to offer. Yet God displays his power and grace as he rescues them. And he does this so that they might live as a light among the nations. As a Christian, you were chosen by God from eternity past. This is no reason for pride. Rather, it should bring us to our knees. Why me, God? We are weak. We have nothing to offer except our brokenness. But he has rescued us from eternity past for eternity future. And what is the purpose of all this, you might ask? Joseph was chosen for a purpose. Israel for a purpose. What about us? Paul reassures us that it is to be made like Jesus. Conformed to his image. Verse 29 elaborates on this. It is so that we might become brothers and sisters of Jesus. We can see what God is doing here, can't we? God is making a family. A family that in all honesty we have no right to be a part of. But God in his grace has adopted us. That day will come when we stand before God as brothers and sisters of Christ, once made from the dust of the ground, now brothers and sisters of the King. This is what the gospel does. It takes us, once made from the dirt of the ground, and he makes us brothers and sisters of the King. And Paul saves perhaps the best news for the end. Those he predestined, he also called, brought to faith. Those he called, he also justified. We are now right before God. Those he justified, he also glorified. Glorified already, but not yet. We are already being glorified, cleansed and renewed, becoming more like Christ each day. But we have not yet been fully glorified. When that day comes, we will no longer sin. We will no longer feel the painful effects of sin. And the Lord Jesus himself will wipe each tear from our eyes. This is the good 
that God is doing in verse 28. This is the unshakable hope we have because it rests 0% on us and 100% on God. And all this is possible, verse 1 and 2, because Jesus has accomplished it. Christ Jesus paved the way to glory by experiencing suffering. Our God does not stand back and shout, try harder. No, he sends his son who cried, it is finished. What a joy to be a Christian. Our current suffering is not in vain, but producing an eternal glory. We know we have a helper who prays for us in our weakness. And we have the joy of knowing that God has loved us from before the dawn of time and has set us apart for his good purpose. A purpose that is set in stone and for our good. That purpose being to bring us all the way home. What a God. What a gospel. What a saviour. Perhaps James is right. My hope in Chelsea is a false hope. But Paul tells us that our hope in God started in eternity past and secures our eternity future. What a hope. Let's pray together. Father God, we are a suffering people. And Lord, so often throughout the course of our lives, we have turned in and asked, where are you, Lord? But this morning we have been reminded of the hope we have anchored in you. And even as we join in prayer now, your spirit is at work, taking this broken prayer, fixing it and delivering it to your throne. Your spirit is taking our sighs of pain carrying our burdens and praying for us through this painful journey. Lord, you are working all things for good. We have been known and loved by you from before the dawn of time. May this truth provide comfort for the weary soul in need of rest. Father, we pray this morning that your family will increase in number. As someone perhaps for the first time comes to faith, in Christ. Lord, thank you for the hope we possess, hope birthed from the suffering of Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, a very fitting hymn, There is a Hope.
And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.